Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are discussing the Anti-Defamation League with Emea Gelman, who teaches at Sarah Lawrence College and is writing a book about the Anti-Defamation League. She recently published an article in the Boston Review called The Anti-Defamation League is Not What It Seems. Emea Gelman, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you so much. Great to be here. Thanks for coming on. So for people who don't know, uh, what is the Anti-Defamation League? What a great question. It's um, it's hard to pin down it necessarily because it um, is a political organization in the United States, but also often thought of as a Jewish organization. It's often thought of as a civil rights organization. It does a lot of foreign policy work. It's sort of unprecedented in the, in the world, the ecology of um, political institutions. So that's a tough question, but um, by and large, <laughs> it is an incredibly influential political institution in the United States that uh, that has as its sort of primary portfolio the defense and interpretation of Israel to the U.S. public and to U.S. political officials. Um, in the course of that work, it has also done lots of other things. Um, part of my work as a historian is to look at how its um, how its origins kind of explain this multifaceted uh, kind of work that it does. Well, I guess who created it and where does it come from is a key question. But first, I'd like to ask the obvious one that we always ask of things in Washington, who pays for it and, and who directs it? Who pays for it and who directs it may be two different things. Um, it is, as far as I, um, you know, I've, I've been able to understand, it's uh, it's charitably funded, which means that it gets at least half of its um, operating funds from the public. But it is also part of the genre of um, of charities that has an endowment. So an endowment allows a charity to, or a, an NGO of any kind, to operate um, somewhat independently of its donations. So I actually should have looked up the budget, but I have not looked up the budget of the ADL. It's um, it's you know many 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 millions of dollars, and um, but that doesn't necessarily reflect the amount of money that they're working with because, um, like many other organizations in the uh, 70s, the 60s and 70s, it started to build up its own reserve of funds. So we often see uh, when the ADL puts on its community organization hat, it holds walks against hate, for example, where you you know maybe your kids have done this. They um, you know, you carry around a sheet and you say, I'm, I'm going to walk five miles. Will you sponsor me $2 a mile? And that money goes into the ADL. Um, but the idea that the ADL actually needs that kind of money, rather than using events like that as sort of a friend raising situation, um, belies the, the enormous endowment that, um, that it has. And it's not unusual in that. It, it, it... What strikes me as unusual, as as remarkable, as as impressive, is to be an anti-hate, anti-racism organization simultaneous with being a defender and quasi spokesperson for one of the most openly hateful, racist, bigoted governments on the planet. I mean, that's that's an accomplishment. <laughs> it is a juggling act for sure. Um, the, I think you could probably make a related argument about institutions that say that they support civil rights and anti-hate and also uphold U.S. militarism. And the Anti-Defamation League is also uh, has also been a supporter of the U.S. militarist state for a long time. In fact, one of the um, sort of areas of study when people look at, at even the whole field of civil rights organizations is how closely tied they became right after in the period right after world war ii during the cold war how closely the the field of civil rights got attached to um sort of foreign policy work and trying to show that the united states was moral so it's it it is difficult to envision the adl as both an anti-hate spokesperson in the present and also advocating a, a government that's currently con committing genocide and calling people you know human animals and uh, you know the list is very long of the um, dehumanizing terminology that the israeli state has used against palestinians it it doesn't it feels like a contradiction but actually 
it arises from the ADL's much longer history as a Cold War organization. I, I'm going to keep pointing to the history. That's my job. I'm a historian. I have to keep going there. I, I want to get to your article and all the decades of history that are in it. Um, but just out of curiosity, has the ADL said anything at all in recent days uh, about what's happening in Gaza? You know, I'm a parent. And so I see the materials that get ho sent home with kids. Um, you know, how should we talk to our children about the war? How should we how should we explain this? And the ADL um, has a, a material called, I think, how to have a conscientious conversation about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which has been sent home with children. And it starts out by saying things like, you know, position yourself as a learner and like, you know, don't don't jump to conclusions. And then it says anti-Zionism is anti is uh, anti-Semitism and make sure that you center Jewish fears uh, as expressed um, about safety, not one word about Palestinians, not one word about the bombings. Um, uh, so the idea that schools are sending this home to to families, you know, including Palestinian families and my family, my I'm, I'm Jewish, my family is anti-Zionist. So they, they've sent home this um, material that tells my children that they're that they're racists. Um, and in conversation with news anchors recently on MSNBC, as I wrote about in the piece that you're um, referring to, or that we that we are uh, that generated this conversation, um, uh, Jonathan Greenblatt, the CEO of the Anti Defamation League, said that anti Zionism was genocide. Um, so referring to all of these tens of thousands of people protesting in the street for a ceasefire as uh, essentially as genocidal and uh, even referred to the demonstration that happened two days ago in Washington, D.C., which, which I was also at with thousands and thousands of Jewish protesters calling for an end to Israeli bombings of Palestinians and referred to that <laughs> hilariously as uh, illegally occupying the, the uh, halls of Congress. And I saw um, aptly the ADL being questioned about whether they did or did not support illegal occupations that they would need to pick a side. Incredible. Um, you, your article, uh, which is, I'll have a link up at talkworldradio.org, but it's in the Boston Review and is called The Anti-Defamation League is Not What It Seems, opens with a somewhat familiar incident involving the ADL and and Congresswoman Ilhan Omar uh, back in March of this year, uh, which relates to this sort of uh, twisting of the definition of anti-Semitism, right? Absolutely. The, I mean, the ADL has always been um, on the attack against the political organizing of Arab and Muslim communities in the United States, which is um, you know, kind of a, a rich contradiction because the the idea of ethnic politics and of uh, communities self-organizing around um, ethnic interests and immigrant interests is endemic to U.S. politics, whether we agree with that or not as a way of, of doing the work. The, so the ADL has always, since, since the beginning of Arab American politics and Muslim politics, always attacked it, always. And when Ilhan Omar took office, of course, she became the the lightning rod for ADL attacks in that regard. But they have gone, you know, that wasn't that was just one one example. They've done the ADL has done an enor enormous amount of Islamophobic um Islamophobic work. Interestingly, um when Islamophobia kind of went out of fashion uh, a little bit in US politics, it's back now, right? But when it went out of fashion for a little while, um, and particularly people started focusing on white nationalists and stopped the insurrection, et cetera, the ADL seems to have expunged not only from its own website, but largely from, from internet searches, much of, of its Islamophobic material and replaced it with anti-white nationalist material, which of course is partly how it builds its, um, its supposed credibility as an anti-racist organization, which is so strange, as you mentioned. It's uh, it, following the the little Nazi rally they had here in Charlottesville, I believe some of this happened, but that, that's actually an improvement, right? You would actually want an organization to swap out hatred of, of Muslims for uh, criticism of white racism, right? I mean, that's a good thing. You would, you would for sure want that um, if it were true. So... <laughs> The the removal of the materials, the sort of front page materials and the public facing materials on Islamophobia 
um, does not mean that the ADL stopped being Islamophobic. And and we can see in the in this heady and really dangerous and difficult moment where the the world is clamoring for an end to anti-Palestinian genocide. And the ADL is on TV saying like, well, this is actually, you know, why isn't anybody talking about like Jewish pain as if um, as if we're not seeing, um, you know, Israeli families with kidnapped children and people in the U.S. saying like, this is, you know, I'm, I'm worried for my safety now as if we're not centering that. So the, the ADL is sort of always back on the always back on the job with like, let's make sure to continue repressing um, Muslims and and continue to repress Palestinians and always say that the reason that we um, that we should do that is because still, still nobody cares enough about anti-Semitism. I will also just add that the ADL's focus on white nationalists has always um, been connected to its own uh, conservative politics. So I, I, I won't dig too far into the history for you, but um, I don't know if you have noticed that a lot of the work against white nationalism is actually very disconnected from movements for um, of movements that are led by people of color, movements against police violence, et cetera. So there is a sort of corner of the movement against white nationalism that's really about like, let's uh, sort of embrace law and order um, and white nationalists are, are defying law and order. And that really would be the ADL's role there. It's not an anti-racist organization. Yeah, this is a certain strain of anti-racist, maybe. But we uh, we're speaking with uh, Emea Gelman, whose article is called "The Anti-Defamation League Is Not What It Seems." Um, about a year ago, uh, there was a similar incident with Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib, where the ADL uh, accused her of anti-Semitism for stating that Israel was an apartheid state, something also stated by most of the biggest human rights groups in the United States and the world and Israel. Uh, and, and, and so, it, and there was no argument, as I recall from the ADL, that it wasn't true. It was simply forbidden to say, and saying it was not only false, but was anti-Semitism, sort of this expansion. And in your article, you talk about the push in Congress to legislate uh, what's anti-Semitism, right? This is bizarre, but this is real, right? It is very real. Um, that art, the article that that you're talking about in the Boston Review, which I wrote in 2019, um, talks a lot about the um, the pushback uh, on the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, which is the Palestinian-led movement, which kind of mirrors the um, the movement that broke South African apartheid. Um, the push against um, the push against those movements has actually taken on a more recent form, which intensifies what you're talking about, which intensifies the claim that saying anything critical about the Israeli state or criticizing Zionism as an ideology is anti-Semitic. And that we often see now in campaigns to adopt what's called the, the IRA definition of anti-Semitism, the definition that comes from the International Holocaust Remembrance association, I think, alliance. Um, and while that sounds like it would be something you would want, right, you would want um, a sort of uh, NGO-based body to to offer a definition of anti-Semitism so that we could, you know, get some clarity on it. In fact, what that definition says is that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, and it does not carve out any space for the, the many, many tens of thousands of Jews who oppose Zionism, who are not interested in supporting the state of Israel, who don't want to be defined by it. Um, the ADL has been really at the heart of, uh, of pushing that definition. And the model that the ADL has so successfully used, which is to, um, to sort of position itself as a civil rights group in order to do pro-Israel work, has actually now... Um, proliferated. So it used to be that the ADL was the main group doing that. And now uh, there's a reporter at the forward, Arno Rosenfeld, who I, whose work I so appreciate, um, who has tracked the emergence of over 48 new anti-anti-Semitism organizations doing much the same work. And with some success, I think, uh, not a national law uh, redefining anti-Semitism, but numerous steps taken by 
state and local governments and institutions and universities and businesses. And in just recent days, we've seen uh, various reporters fired or taken off the air temporarily. Uh, you know, anything that's critical of Israel, whether it's labeled anti-Semitism or not, has clearly been labeled unacceptable, right? It's really interesting in this moment, exactly what you're saying, there's so much repression and a lot of it is informal, right? So MSNBC took its three Muslim anchors off the air, but then reinstated them. You know, did it take them off because Jonathan Greenblatt said that their scripts were being, or asked if their scripts were being written by Hamas, or did it take them off because it was like, we just don't want to deal with the hassle. It's really, it moves in informal ways. And the same is true in academic life. I'm an academic and, and people in the university setting right now are um, students who are protesting for Palestinian freedom, for an end to genocide, for a ceasefire, um, are being uh, sort of misled, mis mis mislabeled uh, as supporting um, anti-Jewish violence, as the, the protest for Israel to stop bombing Palestinians is being read as a, a wish for Israelis to die. I mean, it's really quite stark. And Most, it's not because there's a policy. Mislabeled, mostly mislabeled. Some of them actually say that stuff, which is so damaging. There is certainly, and I'll tell you something else. Yeah, I, I saw a post on Facebook, which uh, really shook me. It was um, it was somebody who, in an, in an activist community, who, uh, not close to the Palestine solidarity world, but in the world of activism, who understood that they should be out in the street protesting. And, and they called, for, they were like, does anybody know where I can find a, a protest for Palestine where nobody says anything I'm not going to agree with? I just thought, like, we can't, right? Like, there's that is not a thing. We all we go out and we protest to stop genocide, and people will say things that we don't agree with. That doesn't mean that we endorse them because we're standing next to them. Doesn't mean we endorse them, and we also can't just we can't pull back from saying stop genocide because there are people who are saying things that we might not agree with. So I, I don't blame people for having a rally against war because of what some jerk show says who shows up at the rally. I do blame the media for focusing exclusively on what that jerk over on the side said at the rally um, because it is so incredibly damaging. I mean, there. Are, yes, I, I understand what you're saying that it's damaging and certainly there are um, if this, if there were ever a time to really think carefully about what the, the impact of your words is, it's now. Like we have this incredible McCarthyite um, backlash that is used to shut down anything that it can be. At the same time, there is a a, a reasonable way of thinking and, and a reasonable call to say that a lot of the things that are being labeled, um, you know, incendiary or or uh, like too harsh are simply rational responses to being colonized and ethnically cleansed, right? So like I, I often think um, like if somebody, I have kids, right? Well, like if somebody did some of the things to my kids that I've seen done to Palestinian kids and if I felt powerless to stop it and if then I had no fuel and I had, you know, like what would my reaction be? It would, it, it probably wouldn't be, let me think about how to say this in a way that the media is gonna understand, you know? So I actually have a lot of sympathy for the for the the things that people are saying that are that are trounced you know that are pounced on like I understand w how agony works I guess even though I agree with you that it's impolitic and yeah well I I, I, I also with almost everything except mass murder um even mass murder that's on a vastly smaller scale than some other mass murder I can say have you heard people calling for mass murder or? uh yeah Unfortunately, yeah. um, okay. well, I'm not done with that. <laughs> and, and I, I, it, which I do not, I, I think you may have misunderstood. I do not for a split second think it's an argument against holding rallies against war. I principally blame people who are sitting home on their couches. I mean, th this is the number one problem in the world, right? Being there at that rally in DC as you, as you did recently was exactly the right thing to do. No question whatsoever. Um, the 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 reason that one of the reasons that people backing one side of war get away with it is because there are people uh speaking stupidly in support of the other side of, of the war this is this is not new um but 
I, I did want to get a chance to talk more about the history of where this comes from, because your article goes in depth uh, into this, into producing yearly reports of anti-Semitism on the rise, uh, into the, you, you talk about the ADL, in fact, as a quasi-state agency, as, as having become part of the government. Can you, can you explain that a little bit? The ADL provides a lot of of the um, services might be the wrong word, sort of the the infrastructure functions of government, or at least of of sort of shared society. So, for example, um, when there is a, a racist incident at a school, right? Often it's the ADL who gets called in to do a workshop or um, to, you know to an assembly or whatever to try and. I don't know, write the moral fabric of the school. And it's not because there are no other possible actors to do that. It's because the ADL has been kind of um, enmeshed in the fabric of the moral fabric of the state. So it's uh, it, get, it doesn't get questioned. It gets um, it is identified with liberal values. I mean, li you know, liberalism in the sort of capital L sense um, It is. Uh, sort of handed a watchdog role. And that's actually not just the case in our in our school communities, but also, I mean, I worked for the city council in New York City for a while. The, the ADL was on speed dial, right? Like anybody was had any kind of question about, about whether something was racist or whether something was, um, you know, sort of appropriate. And the ADL got the call. Or if not the ADL, then... Um, the sort of network of, of civil rights organizations that's connected to it. And uh, and it performs this function in schools, in government. Um, it gets consulted on legislation. The interesting thing about it historically is that it's not only in the field of anti-Semitism or anti-Semitism watchdogging. It also historically is an anti-communist organization. And I think if we don't, um, if we don't situate it in that history, especially now that the cold war is back right everything is socialism right like anytime we want to pass a pass a bit of uh, anti-racist legislation or social welfare legislation it gets referred to in these cold war terms um and the adl is the the classic anti-communist organization trying to teach americans that um that the solution to problems including racism and including inequality can only be capitalism and individualism so um, so it performs this in a, in a lot of different spaces from community spaces to legislative spaces to, you know, the offices of elected officials who are trying to figure out what to do. Uh, another sense in which you discuss ADL's power as a quasi-governmental institution is its role in vetting what's acceptable in fora like, like YouTube. Can you, can you talk about the, this sort of power? Sure. I mean, that's a symptom of um, of a largely corporate controlled uh, infrastructure of society um, as the as control over our daily lives gets sort of narrowed and funneled. And we have, you know, Jack Sobiec or whatever <laughs> controlling the discourse. A lot of it's Ari Elon Musk. Um, the, the the ADL's role as a as a go to authority has kind of expanded because these are institutions that are, they're controlling public life, um, but they need to, um, they need to show that they are making reference to civil society in order to, in order to be regulating well. And civil society is not a neutral, um, a neutral term. It's a construction of who, you know, whatever organizations and people have had enough power to elevate themselves into these representative positions. So the ADL is indeed, you know, because it um, is because of its reputation as a as a civil rights organization and as a um, a legislative organiz a legislative advocacy organization, it finds itself there. I, I would argue that it's also because it's a white led organization. The ADL often tries to refute the fact that it's a white led organization, but it is. And if you can just imagine, you know, let's say, um, you know, Facebook was trying to find somebody to vet um, to to make sure that it wasn't posting racist content. If it had a black led organization doing that work, then it would be um, suspected of being like too far to the left and not being, in, you know, not including all uh, all viewpoints, et cetera. So to a certain extent, having a white led organization and one that can sort of 
through the through identification with Jewishness also identify a little bit with marginality really gives the ADL a kind of um, credibility to be put into these positions of authority. And so it does indeed regulate, um, it works, it created a Silicon Valley uh, center to try and coordinate tech organizations to um, adopt its principles. So again, partly their principles about inclusion, but largely their principles about don't criticize Israel. And as a result, we see now I'm I'm shadow banned on Twitter. I can't post anything on Twitter because I've posted too much about Palestine or and or the ADL. We hear from Palestinian um, people who are simply reporting on the violence that's happening to them, that their um, their accounts are flagged. We've heard from uh, from black organizers that when they talk about the, the racism that they've experienced, that their accounts are flagged. So uh, the ADL is very central in this sort of civility discourse, which actually turns out to reinforce power and silence people who are trying to, to challenge it. We just got about two minutes left. Amaya Gelman, it, it, it still strikes me as bizarre in this age when even organizations with a distant history of racism are, are being made to apologize and set things right and make reparations that you have an organization with a history of supporting anti-Arab violence and hatred. And, uh, and currently uh, it, it's, you know, leading focus is defending an apartheid state uh, being held up as this, this model and arbiter of, uh, of, of anti-racism. It's, it's very, very hard to understand. I, um, I published an article actually yesterday uh, I think yesterday, and Mondo Weiss called The ADL is Fueling War. And in it, um, I pointed to the the ways that the ADL, which has been brought onto MSNBC to comment on like, you know, how is this, how is this war working out? Um, and about concerns about anti-Semitism that may be generated by the war. Uh, and in the course of that interview, that was where Jonathan Greenblatt, the CEO of the ADL, um, mentioned that there was uh, the that there was supposed to be a day of jihad and that complained that nobody had covered it. Like all community leaders hadn't covered it. And this was evidence that he was citing. He, this is evidence that people don't care about anti-Semitism. But the day of jihad um, claim came from white nationalist Twitter. <laughs> so I think I, I and similarly, uh, when the ADL claimed that the Jewish, um, the Jewish led protests in Washington, D.C., you know, should, nobody should listen to these like right wing ra or left wing radical Jews, which is like just people praying in the in the cap in the uh, in Congress. I think that with the current the, I think with the current situation that the ADL has really jumped the shark um, and that these contradictions that you're pointing to are, are becoming untenable. Um, so it's my hope that that it will be more obvious and that that they'll be deplatformed a little bit because they just can't maintain this this contradiction between being a racist organization and um, saying that they are anti-racist. I hope you are right. I hope that we will see each other before too long at a protest of the ADL. And uh, thank you very, very much to Emea Gelman for uh, coming on Talk World Radio. Thanks so much, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.